There was a date uh, about 23 years ago, uh, in April of uh, 19th of 1995, there was a man named MacArthur Wheeler. You may recognize his name, you may not. Uh, but he robbed two banks on that day in broad daylight. His image was captured on video surveillance cameras and it was aired on the, the news that night. And within minutes of airing this man's image from the video surveillance footage, uh, tips were phoned in and uh, identifying this man uh, as the criminal. And shortly thereafter, he was visited by the police officers. Now, when he was questioned by it, he was presented with the evidence and he replied in an incredulous disbelief that the cameras had actually captured his image. His response was the now infamous phrase, but I wore the juice. It turns out that Mr. Wheeler knew a little bit about how lemon juice could be used as invisible ink, <laughs> allowing you to write on paper and expose the message when applying it to heat. So with this fact in mind, he had the, <laughs> he had the genius idea that he could make his image invisible to security cameras if he just put lemon juice on his face. <clears throat> so that's what he did. <laughs> and uh, for those of you who think this might be a good idea, I'll break the news to you. It doesn't work. <laughs> but if this conclusion isn't uh, silly enough, what's most dumbfounding about this is how Mr. Wheeler genuinely believed that something must be wrong. He, he knew he had to be right. He was full of pride in himself that he had outwitted technology because he knew better. He knew that lemon juice could cause invisibility. Now, of course, he was wrong. Now, this serves as a, a pretty striking uh, and humorous example of the self-deception of pride. Pride turns out to be the greatest when skill and knowledge are the least. <laughs> it's uh, funny how that works. When if somebody believes or knows just a little bit about something, there is a, a, a peak of, of pride there, of confidence. <clears throat> this is, of course, not true for those who know that they know nothing about a subject, but are aware that they know nothing. However, this should serve to us as a warning, uh, which is not foreign to Christians. I'll cite this for you from 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 12. We read this very succinct phrase, therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. It's a very simple warning for us. If we think we know something, we better be careful. Pride is such a human trait. It's a sin that we can all fall into. It's a trap. But in this succinct statement written to the Corinthians, we are told to be careful of how we think of ourselves. We are warned to not think too highly of our own abilities. Pride, truly, is among the sneakiest traits known to man. It is one of the most damaging of sins as well, because it has a tendency to elevate man above God. And it builds faulty justifications around those beliefs. Now that we have just finished the Feast of Unleavened Bread, as we heard in the sermonette, we've spent a lot of time thinking about removing sin from our lives. And uh, I think now is a, a perfect time for us to all raise our attention to the need to follow through. We cannot let our guard down now. And this sin of pride is one that I want to look at because it is so sneaky. It is so difficult 
that uh, is pervasive in, in the lives of human beings. So I want to look at four basic questions today. You know, we'll ask what the characteristics of prides are, of pride, what the characteristics of pride are, what kind of damage pride can do, how we can detect pride in our lives, and ultimately, how can we defeat pride? <clears throat> so let's turn over to Ezekiel 28 and read verses 12 through 17. This provides us uh, a good starting point to learn about some of the characteristics of pride that, that are written in the Bible. This is about the king of Tyre, and as we understand it, in the Church of God, this describes <clears throat> Lucifer's fall. Ezekiel 28 and verse 12. Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created, until iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground, I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. Lucifer was lifted up. He was perfect, created by God. He had so much going for him. And right away in this example, we can see what he did with that. We can see that with these good gifts that he was given, that it went straight to his head. And this is where it begins for us too. The sin of pride is at the root of so many other kinds of sins. Pride, if there's one thing that characterizes it, it is self-serving. Pride declares that man's way is better than God's way. It lifts up the self, putting everyone else, including God, at a distance. In this case, Lucifer wanted to elevate himself above God. But it was the wrong thing to do. Let's go over to Isaiah 14 and read verses 13 and 14. This is a very similar scripture that also describes... Uh, situation, very very similar, the fall of Lucifer. Once again is the, the heading of this section in the New King James Version of the Bible. Isaiah 14 and verse 13. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation. On the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. And in fact, this can be also stated, I will be the Most High. This is a very clear reference to the attitude of Satan. He wants to be above God. He thinks that he can do better. He thinks that his way is superior to the way of righteousness that God has, has taught us all. The man of sin, who will be under the influence of Satan in, uh, mm -hmm. in the future, he will sit in the temple, also declaring that he is God. That is pride, taken to its pinnacle. And this 
<laughs> it should be no surprise that pride is uh, at the root of so many sins in our human life. Satan, as we can see, is <laughs> this is the core problem that he has. He believes that he can do better than God. And he wants us humans to feel the same way, that we are better than God too. Under his influence, pride builds up in man. Let's go over to, uh, actually, I, I will read Proverbs 21, verse 4 from the New Living Translation. Haughty eyes, a proud heart, and evil actions are all sin. It should be no surprise that pride is sin. That is a, a very important characteristic of pride. It is sinful. And why is it sinful? It is because it, it elevates man's way above God's way. It rejects God's way. That is the core problem with pride. Let's go over to Revelation 3 and uh, read verses 17 and 18. So if one of the char characteristics of pride is that it is sinful, that it elevates man above God, another characteristic is that pride is very sneaky. It's hard to detect. Revelation 3 and verse 17. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy for me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments, that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. We can see here that pride is the source of the problem of the church of Laodicea. This church actually has the truth. We, we understand that they do. They have blessings. There's no doubt that they, they've been blessed. They have riches. They have wisdom. But they've also forgotten God. They don't realize how much they are actually in need. Pride has lifted them up They've become powerful in and of themselves to the point where they don't think they need God. And that is exactly the perspective that Lucifer had that caused his fall. This should be a huge warning to all of us. And what is the prescription here? <laughs> the prescription is to open your eyes, evaluate yourself plainly. You don't realize, as the Church of Laodicea is addressed here, you don't realize how much trouble you have, how much you need me. These are the words of God, paraphrased. It's a very difficult thing to see when pride has taken hold. Pride lifts man above God. Friedrich Nietzsche is infamous for saying that God is dead. Now, I'm no apologist for this guy, but his comment that God is dead was in reference to the fact uh, that mankind in his age had become so uh, empowered. They had overcome a lot in his age. They'd been able to discover new things, make huge advancements as uh, society and mankind. So much so that they did not need God. It's an attitude. <laughs> the church of Laodicea is behaving as if God is dead. It's probably strong. But we can't behave that same way. We need God to be in our lives. We cannot allow God to be dead in our lives. Pride is what will cause that uh, to stir up. How much do you rely on God in your life, day to day? It needs to be everywhere. Let's go to 1 Corinthians and read verse uh, in chapter 3, and verses 18 and 19.
1 Corinthians 3, verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. Pride is deceptive. That is another characteristic. When we think we know what's right and good in life, according to worldly wisdom, because it produces results, it's deceitful. We need to be careful. Financial crises have happened in the world because short-term money-making schemes were based on greed, on man's wisdom instead of God's wisdom, on a quick buck instead of uh, sound, good practices of loving one another. The instruction here that we read in Corinthians is to make sure that we keep worldly wisdom in its place. It's useful, there's no doubt. We can't be without worldly wisdom, but it is not enough for us to draw close to God. Worldly wisdom can do nothing to really help us in becoming righteous and becoming close to God. It's useless in that regard. But pride will tell you otherwise. Pride tells you and I that we know the way. We know the way that will benefit us, that will do us uh, the, the most good. We need to be careful whenever we think that. We need to trust in God instead. Let's go over to James 4 and read about another symptom, another characteristic of pride. James 4, I'll begin in verse 1. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? You lust and you do not have, you murder and you covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you might spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says in vain, the spirit which dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. We can see here the connection between lust, seeking our own gain, our own worldly gain, and pride. The proud seeks their own gain. They lift themselves up. They look for uh, hoarding for themselves. They lust. They look for pleasures for themselves. But humility provides a better way. So these are several characteristics of pride that we can uh, understand. We know that it separates us from God, and that is that is one of the core characteristics. It, pride lifts man above others, especially above God, and it seeks its own. That is what pride does. Now, the nature of pride is something that we should all understand. I'm certain that I'm not sh uh, sharing anything that you haven't thought about in the past. But what are, what are the consequences of pride? That kind of pride that lifts us up, that makes us feel good, that seeks our own gain. What's the big deal with seeking our own gain anyway? What... What are the consequences? Let's go over to Proverbs 
uh, 6 and read verses 16 through 19. You can read a little bit about how God sees pride. It is mixed and uh, mentioned in the context of several other things that God hates. Proverbs 6 and verse 16. These six things the Lord hates, yes, seven are an abomination to him. Number one, a proud look. Continuing, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deceives or devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. <laughs> right out of the gate, what do we read about what is an abomination? It is pride. Tops the list, number one. It is clear from here <laughs> that pride is sinful, and we know how sin is ultimately punished. There is a clear result. Sin has a very expectant result in death, if it is unrepented of. Let's go back to Psalm 94 and read a, a few scriptures there from 1 to 11. Psalm 94, beginning in verse 1. O Lord God, to whom vengeance belongs, O God, to whom vengeance belongs, shine forth, rise up, O judge of the earth, render punishment to the proud. Lord, how long will the wicked, how long will the wicked triumph? They utter speech and speak insolent things. All the workers of iniquity boast in themselves. They break in pieces your people, O Lord, and afflict your heritage. They slay the widow and the stranger and murder the fatherless. Yet they say, The Lord does not see, nor does the God of Jacob understand. Understand, you senseless among the people, and you fools, when will you be wise? He who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? He who instructed the nations, shall he not correct? He who teaches man knowledge, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, that they are futile. The proud will be seen for their works eventually, and they will receive punishment. There is a consequence. There is a result, and a, a one that is very unpleasant. God is no dummy. Even though the proud who seek gain for themselves might find some favorable results from their efforts through their worldly wisdom, it will ultimately come to a head. It will ultimately be judged by God. They will need to account for their works. Pride is what leads men to, as we read in James, go to war. Pride is what leads man to take advantage of others, to perform all types of sin that does not express love towards mankind. The consequence of pride is the punishment of sin, plain and simple. If unrepented of, the result is death. Let's go back to Isaiah and uh, chapter 2. I'd like to read verses 11 and 12, Isaiah 2, and verse 11. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. For the Lord, uh, excuse me, for the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon everything proud and lofty, upon everything lifted up, and it shall be brought low. Here we can see the consequence. There will be a final reckoning in that day of the Lord. <laughs> that eventful time in the near future. Those who have lifted themselves up, believing that they are something when they are actually not, 
they will be humbled. They will be brought low. Turn a few pages over to Isaiah 10, and we'll read verses 12 through 16. Isaiah 10, in verse 12, here we are reading about the uh, king of Assyria. Therefore it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all all his work on Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his haughty looks. We'll pause there for a moment as we understand from biblical prophecy that the king of Assyria was used by God to serve his purpose and the nation of Assyria will be used again in the future to serve God's purpose to punish the nations of Israel. Continuing in verse 13 of Isaiah 10, For he, the king of Assyria, says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, by my wisdom, for I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand has found like a nest the riches of the people. As one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth. And there was no one who uh, moved his wing, nor opened his mouth, even with a peep. It's quite a, uh, a proud statement there, made by the king of Assyria. And here we read the response. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw exalt itself against him who saws with it? as if a rod could wield itself against those who lift it up, or as if a staff could lift up, as if it were not wood. Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. The king of Assyria was used by God, but like Lucifer, who was perfect, who had experienced good things, this king of Assyria became proud and will become proud in the future, thinking that he has accomplished things of his own might, of his own good, of his own strength. But it is God who is using him to serve his purpose. And this pride will be cut down. As we read here, this pride will be punished. Even though the king of Assyria was used by God, doesn't mean that the pride will go unrecognized. I'll read a passage from Obadiah for you. Uh, these are verses 1 through 4 in Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom, we have heard a report from the Lord, and a messenger has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise, and let us rise up against her for battle. Behold, I will make you small among the nations. You shall be greatly despised. The pride of your heart has deceived you. You who dwell in the clefts of the rock, whose habitation is high, you who say in your heart, Who will bring me down to the ground? Though you ascend high, as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, from there I will bring you down, says the Lord. The nation of Edom receives a warning that we should all listen to ourselves as well. Pride is a deceiver. Sure, we might accomplish great things in life. We might become successful in our uh, the way that we conduct our our business, our lives. But what does that mean? Does it make us feel good that we are untouchable? That we're righteous? Is that what we think? Well, we have to keep our success in mind. We have to know that all good gifts come from God. And pride, when we think we are something, we have to be, again, very aware 
of how high we've lifted ourselves lest we fall. Pride is always humbled. It is always brought low. There are these consequences. Pride is sinful, and it will be punished. It goes, it will be recognized by God. So that answers the first two questions. The third question about how to detect pride is the trickiest. I don't uh, intend to give you a one-size-fits-all answer here, but I hope that I can provide you at least some, some ways of, of helping to detect pride in, in our lives. And the best way that I find to detect pride is by asking who is served by our actions and deeds. Who are we serving? Are we serving ourselves? Or are we serving others? Are we serving God? Are we more concerned about the effects on ourselves than the effect of others? Or are our actions and motivations working to build up others? Are we acting to uh, serve a bigger purpose than the elevation of ourselves? Are we trying to glorify God in our conduct? Or are we trying to glorify ourselves? Who do we serve in our actions, our thoughts, and our deeds? Now, you may find the answers to these questions if you're asking them, and if you ask them afterwards today, to be very difficult to answer. They really are. Pride is extremely deceptive. It is very difficult to remove ourselves from our own judgment and answer these objectively, but yet that is what we are charged to do. Uh, as we are uh, taught elsewhere in the Bible, that we are to examine ourselves. It's a responsibility to ask these questions. But this one, as I mentioned, asking whom we serve is a, a good place to start. Now, we are not expected to be pushovers in our lives. If we think that the answer to the question is that I cannot do anything to uh, serve myself, I, that's not the point I'm trying to make. Jesus Christ, uh, he was the one who taught us to turn the other cheek when confronted with violence, but he also actively escaped danger on several occasions when he knew it was imminent. We have to use our correct judgment. We don't want to tempt God and put ourselves in danger. But making the distinction between serving ourselves out of pride and seeking personal fulfillment and success in life is, is difficult. It really is. Uh, we certainly want to make judgments that will help us to succeed in life. There's no doubt. And in a way, you could say, you could make an argument that that is seeking self. But there's a, a subtle distinction. Are we seeking to glorify ourselves or are we seeking success so that we can be fulfilled and enjoy the life that we've been given. So I, I think uh, a good way of also uh, asking this question is to not only ask who we are, who we are serving, but also ask what end we are looking for. Are we taking an action because we are concerned with our own reputation and our own position? If we are, pride and self-seeking might be at play. Are we too good for something? That's a good question too. If we are too good for something out of virtue, say that we don't want to participate in some ungodly behavior, that's good. <laughs> it's okay to be too good for certain things if the end is, is virtuous. But if we are too good for something because we think it is below us uh, and our reputation would take a hit, if we uh, think that the type of work that we might do, <laughs> perhaps doing concrete work, is uh, not 
not good for our character, not good for our family name, then pride might be at play. But if we perform an action regardless of how it makes us appear, whether it puts us into an elevated position or not, it's, uh, it is not likely to be born out of pride. If the end that we seek is to serve a higher purpose, to glorify God or to help somebody else, that takes the self-seeking element out of pride. If we are driven by a purpose that is greater than ourselves, then glorification of self has no position. You can't glorify yourself if you're trying to glorify God. Those two things don't fit together. And making these distinctions is very difficult to do. It takes some, uh, some time. It takes, uh, boy, some very careful discernment as well. But it's something we need to practice. So I've got a, a several scriptures here that I'd like to read. <clears throat> the first one is a, a story. Let's go over to 2 Kings and uh, begin in verse or chapter 5 and read verses... 7 through 15. You may think I'm serving myself by drinking this water, but I'm actually serving you. <clears throat> so that I don't interrupt myself here. All right. <clears throat> Second Kings chapter 5, verse 7. Here we read about Naaman. Um, Naaman was a, a Syrian uh, general. Uh, he was very good, very successful, and he was blessed in his efforts. Uh, but he also had uh, leprosy that plagued him. So this is a story about uh, him. Second Kings 5, verse 7. And it happened when the king of Israel read the letter. Uh, so this is after Naaman had sent a letter to the king of Israel asking to uh, be healed. Uh, so when the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, Am I God to kill and to make alive, that this man sends a man to me to heal him of his leprosy? Therefore, please consider and see how he seeks to quarrel with me. And so the king of Israel is quite concerned here. So it was when Elisha, the man of God, <clears throat> heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes that he sent to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Please let him come to me, and he shall know that there is a prophet in Israel. Elisha knew that this was an opportunity to glorify God, glorify Israel, not glorify himself. Elisha could have quite simply said, Okay, this is a great chance for me to look good, but that's not the point. Elisha wanted God to be glorified through healing, the nation of Israel to be glorified. <clears throat> so continuing on, then Naaman went with his horses and chariot, and he stood at the door of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you, and you shall be clean. But Naaman became furious and went away and said, Indeed, I said to myself, He will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and heal the leprosy. Are you not the Ebana and the Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Could I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned away and and went away in a rage. Then his servants came near and spoke to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do something great, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, Wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped seven times in the Jordan according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of the little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his aides, and came and stood before him and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. Now, therefore, please take a gift from your servant. 
Here, Naaman was seeking healing, something that was right to seek. And uh, he acknowledged that he needed help, which is itself an act of humility. That is one of the keys to overcoming pride is to be humble, to understand when we need help. He looked for help from the nation of Israel. This, uh, it, this too was a, an act of humility. The nation of Israel was not nearly as powerful as Syria, and he even brought payment, yet another humble act. But when he was told that he needed uh, what he needed to do to receive healing, he wasn't pleased. He was told to, yeah, just go wash yourself, just take a bath. <laughs> and how did Naaman receive that? He was furious because he was told to go take a bath. I can bathe anywhere, he said. I, I didn't have to come down here to Israel to take a bath. I could have done that at home. He was insulted. He wanted to be healed on his own terms. He wanted to be grandiose, amazing, and he found it insulting to receive the simple instruction that he had received. But then, what did he do? He humbled himself yet again and followed the instructions of God. And then he was healed once he was fully humbled. Now this shows how sneaky pride can be. We see several examples here of humility, of correct, good, righteous behavior. But pride was still there. Pride lurks in the dark corners, even in the shadows of humility. It's there, <laughs> but it needs to be completely purged. It's a, a good example to look at. Uh, let's go over to Psalm 10 and read verse 3. So in understanding how to identify and detect pride, uh, we need to first be aware that it, it lurks. It <laughs> takes some, some work to discover it, and it takes humility to really find it. In Psalm 10 and verse 3, we can read about uh, a symptom, and this is boasting. For the wicked boasts of his heart desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is in none of his thoughts. Boasting of wealth and accumulation can serve no one but self. It only serves to elevate man and all the things that he can gain of his own, own power. When we serve ourselves, God is not served. This is how we can detect. Another symptom that might indicate pride is entitlement. Do we ever feel entitled? There's a question I want you to consider that we deserve something just because. Let's go to Matthew 7 and read verses 21 through 23. We can read about several people here who felt entitled. Matthew 7, and verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. You uh, Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Doing something good can sometimes serve only ourselves. If we do something good, even if that act was done itself uh, in a selfless manner, do we ever feel entitled to a reward, that we deserve something? Perhaps a generous offering was made, or someone who was in need was helped. Have you ever felt the need for recognition or, re or a reward? 
that something was deserved because of that. Well, that can offer an indication of pride that might be lurking. That feeling of entitlement can be there and help you detect pride. <clears throat> Second Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1, we can read about uh, perilous times that will come. There. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3, beginning, beginning in verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pre pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but denying its power. And from such people turn away. For of this sort are those who creep into households and make captives of gullible women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Several attributes are mentioned in very strong terms of condemnation. And these are all attributes that serve man and glorify man above God. These are symptoms of pride. These are ways for us to detect when we have pride in our own lives. If we feel any of those characteristics take, uh, take rise, if they bubble to the surface, uh, that might be an indication for us to do something about it. These characteristics, these attributes also have a unique result they prevent people from coming to the knowledge of the truth, which should be no surprise. In order to learn the truth, one needs to be humble enough to receive it. Learning, by definition, means that we don't know something, that we are in need, and we have to be ready to receive it and learn it. No one can be taught if they know everything already. And the proud are the, those who know everything and have no space to learn the righteousness. Let's go over to James 3 and read verses 13 through 18. James 3 and verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done in the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy, and self-seeking in your hearts. Do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, and demonic. For where envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Bitter envy is a very close relative to entitlement. Uh, bitter envy seeks you know, gain for self, and it puts a target on somebody else's forehead. Again, we see here self-seeking, and how it stands in contrast to seeking the truth, seeking the peace of God. Romans 2, verses 4 through 11. Oh, here we read about uh, a grim result of pride and self-seeking. Romans 2 and verse 4. Or do you despise the riches of his goodness, forbearance and long-suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to to repentance. Again, repentance is uh, it is a result of humility. If we have humility, it opens us up to repentance. In verse 5, but in accordance with your, har your hardness and your impertinent heart, you are treasuring up for yourself wrath in the day uh, uh, of wrath 
and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will, who will render to each one according to his deeds. Eternal life to those who, by patient continuance and doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish, on every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek, but glory and honor and peace to everyone who works what is good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for there is no partiality with God. Now, there may be a satisfying outcome and effect in worldly terms when self-seeking is successful. Certainly, there are many out there in the world today who uh, are quite happy seeking for themselves. In fact, pride is, uh, in some cases, people find it a virtue. But this is not an outcome that will bear fruit in the long run. In fact, the fruit of pride winds up turning into... <laughs> the treasure of wrath, and that is not something that I think any of us want. As mentioned here, the treasure on earth correlates very much with the expectation of judgment in that final time, not too far ahead. Detecting pride uh, as we have seen from several of these examples, seek self above seeking God. That is something that uh, we can all take away. That is the principal way of detecting pride in our lives. If we find that we have self-seeking ways, then we need to do something about it. So what is this last question that we want an answer to you. How can we defeat it? Now that we've found it, now that we've identified where it is in our lives, what can we do about it? Well, we have to deal with the root cause. And if that root cause is seeking self, it turns out to have a pretty straightforward way of overcoming that. Instead of seeking the benefit of ourselves, we can fight pride at its roots by seeking the benefit of others. It's very simple. In, in word, at least. Instead of seeking glory for ourselves, we can fight pride by seeking the glory of God. It can be very difficult to do anything less than that if we want to remove pride in our lives. It's, it's one thing to find it and to say, like, I've got a pride problem in this area of my life. I'm going to try not to feel prideful, but it's, it's, not, it's not that easy. <laughs> to just not feel prideful is not enough. We still fall prey as humans to seek our, the glory of our, our own ourselves. But by removing ourselves from that and seeking the benefit of others, uh, that is the way to cut pride down at the root. It takes practice, of course, uh, as simple as it is to say. It takes some, uh, some effort. So let's look at a few scriptures that can help us in that regard. Going back to Proverbs 22, we'll read verse 4. Proverbs 22 and verse 4. It starts here. By humility and fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility is where it starts. The benefits of humility and living godly lives, as we read from this scripture, have a, a result in this life now, but also in the life eternal. We don't have to wait for humility to bear fruit. But it starts there. Humility is the first thing that we have to do if we want to remove ourselves and seek the benefit of others. Uh, still in Proverbs, let's go to Proverbs 16 and read verses 
18 through 20. Proverbs 16 and verse 18. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. He who heeds the word wisely will find good, and whoever trusts in the Lord, happy is he. Humility, we read here, needs to be combined with the trust of God. It's not enough to just cut ourselves uh, out of the picture. Actually, that's not the right way to say it. It's not enough for ourselves to acknowledge our weakness. We need to replace that weakness with some kind of source of strength, and that is God. We trust in God. Still in Proverbs, let's go to uh, chapter 11 and read verse 2. Proverbs 11 and verse 2. When pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Humility is how wisdom begins. When we acknowledge our lowly position in life, especially relative to God, we become receptive to improving. We understand that we have so much to learn. If we had, have pride, there is no way to become better. Humility is where we need to begin to uh, overcome pride, and that is, by definition, uh, acknowledging weakness and uh, looking to improve for a greater purpose. Let's go to Luke 6 and read verses 27, the beginning in verse 27. Luke 6, beginning in verse 27. This is all about the empathy. Once we uh, stop seeking ourselves, we need to flip the other side of the coin and help others. Luke 6 and verse 27. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you and pray for those who spitefully use you. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods, do not ask them back. And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. And verse 27, but if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Excuse me. Sorry, verse 32. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. But it, And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you? For even sinners lend to sinners and receive as much back. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Empathy is an amazing tool to use if you want to overcome pride. It's exceptional, in fact, uh, if you understand what it does. Empathy is the practice of coming out of ourselves and actively working to understand the life and the needs and the suffering of another from their perspective. When you practice empathy, there is no place for yourself. You're not present in that practice. You understand and walk in the footsteps of one another. Empathy, when it is mixed with action as we read here, is love. And love is the pinnacle of what we need to uh, do if we want to overcome pride. Love expresses concern for another. And it does so without concern for the effect on self. Love offers us the number one way of defeating pride. Offering it to your enemies is a way of 
bringing that to the, the its end, its, its greatest fulfillment. Let's read a little bit more about love from 1 Corinthians 13. I'll read verses 4 through 8. This, of course, will be familiar to you. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. It thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. Believes all things. Hopes all things. Endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. It is a beautiful thing, this practice of love. It is absolutely good. It cares for another and has no concern for the uh, expected result. When love functions in our lives, it cannot leave space for pride to do anything. Act in your life out of love and you will overcome pride. Philippians 2, and verses 3 through 9. Jesus Christ gave us the perfect example of love. Uh, it is one that we should all reflect on and certainly have all reflected on during this uh, Passover season and spring holy days. Philippians 2, verse 3. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. The humbled and exalted Christ uh, is the next heading. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. Uh, uh, with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. God the Father gave his own son, Jesus Christ, out of love. Jesus Christ offered his own life. He was killed, sacrificed, because he loved us even before he knew us. He knew what the result would be. He sacrificed himself. He offered love. There was no pride in that. And that is a way of overcoming pride. And selfish ambition stands opposed to this, 100%. Let's go over to Psalm 34. And I'll read verses 1 through 3. Now love, as we understand, is the most powerful tool to overcome pride. But it's also very important to uh, understand what end we are seeking. And that is to glorify God more than ourselves. Psalm 34 and verse 1. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear of it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Unlike boasting of ourselves and our own skill and our own strength has a tendency to glorify ourselves, boasting in God's goodness and his mercy and the plan that he has, that glorifies God. And that is what we want to seek. Glorifying God instead of ourselves helps us to overcome pride. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians 12 
and read verses 7 through 10. We have to realize where our strength comes from. As we function in this life we live, uh, we are weak. We acknowledge that. And we need strength. And Paul acknowledged this as well. 2 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches, in needs and persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Especially when we are fortunate enough to receive blessings from God, it is human nature to be lifted up by it and think we are something of ourselves. As Paul reflects here, he was given the gift of so much understanding and knowledge. But he understood that uh, he also needed to have the understanding that he still needed God's strength. That this, there was a tendency of pride. And he acknowledged his weakness. And when we do the same, we become humble. We give space for God to function in our lives. We need to acknowledge our weakness so that we can make space for God to be glorified. Paul makes a great summarizing statement in Romans, and I'll use that for my summarizing statement as well. This is in Romans 12 and verse 3. Romans 12 and verse 3, he says this, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. In simple terms, we are instructed to be careful of how we think of ourselves. When we think soberly, it enables us to honestly evaluate our motivations so we can detect the self-seeking that the, uh, pride is uh, related to. When we find that self-seeking, we need to do something about it. When we acknowledge our weakness and add humility to it, it opens us up to incorporate the necessary tools to defeat pride. Humility, love, and faith. By that, we bear the fruit of the Spirit and we glorify God instead of ourselves. <laughs>